through the evening lecture series, and I am introducing our lovely speaker who is talking about um, media and political psychology, so how media affects politics. And our, our speaker today is Dr. Tony Bryson. He is the Director of Information Technology Security at Mesa Community College. So, he has a PhD in psychology with a concentration in media. So, without any further ado, here's our speaker. Thank you. That's loud. Quick show of hands here. Who is here because they have an interest in media and political psychology? And who is here because they're getting extra credit? <laughs> Excellent. I like it. Okay, well, I want to thank you all for coming. Um, hopefully, you're going to enjoy tonight's presentation. The presentation is entitled, How Mass Media Reinforces the Divide in the National Political Discourse for Fun and Profit. Before we begin, I would like to make a few comments about this presentation. First, the presenter may be forced to use colorful language inappropriate for minors throughout the program. You have been warned. Second, the thoughts of and of the subject matter are mine and are in no way representative of Mesa Community College or the Psychology Department. Some of you may find the information presented as conflicting with your perceptions. As we will discover during this presentation, this is almost purely beyond my control. Finally, I'm not kidding when I say that some may get torqued during this presentation. The subject matter was controversial for my dissertation committee and led to some interesting discussions. I suspect that some people in the room may feel the same way. I will also add that because of the complex, na complex nature of this presentation and many of the theories it relies upon, I will be replying, relying heavily on my speaker notes so I can eliminate missteps and prevent the spread of misinformation. I hope you understand and support this. So onward we go. My name is Dr. Bryson. Some of, me, some of you may know me as the Information Security Officer here at MCC, but I also have a secret dark side. Before I begin, I think it's important to be full disclosure here. I think you should know where my perspective comes from. I'm not originally from the United States. I was born and raised in Canada, but the most conservative part of Canada. I was raised in a conservative family with conservative Canadian values. In Arizona, I have visited or lived in 42 of the 50 United States. I married an American, my lovely wife is here, and immigrated to the United States shortly after 9-11. I became a United States citizen in 2007. So that makes me a dual citizen. Canadians view me as an American. Americans view me as a Canadian. My dual citizenship gives me access to both Canada and the United States, but I find myself as a man of no country. The final red line that you see on this map is the no man zone between the two countries. It's a hundred yard wide cut of land through the trees on the border and is the limbo that I like to call home. Please be advised that I've heard every Canadian joke and comments about my native land, so nothing shocks me in that regard. <coughs> so, yes, Canada is America's hat. But on that same train of thought, America is Canada's underwear. <laughs> Texas, you have some explaining to do with the lady that does our laundry. I'm sure some of you are wondering what makes me a subject matter expert on this topic. My education stacks up like this. My Bachelor of Arts is in Information Technology Systems awarded from Ottawa University. My Master's Degree and PhD were awarded to me by Field and Graduate University in California with a concentration in media psychology. I am a member of the American Psychological Association in Division 46, designated as media psychology. I've lectured and taught at Ottawa University, Fielding Graduate University and the University of California, Los Angeles by extension. So all of this adds up to 
to make me a media psychologist. Now, the first question I get after telling people this is, what the hell is a media psychologist? Simply stated, media psychology studies the communication and use of media. We try to understand the motivations of why people use media and the effects it has on those who consume media. Media psychology is a very broad field that is really a convergence of many fields of study. Some media psychologists attempt to simplify the field, but media consumption is such a complex process, I think simplification does the field a disservice. Here are some of the specific areas where my cohort is specialized. I tend to see all of these subjects as being relevant to my concepts of media consumption. So I take a more compound view when talking about each subject. The second question I always get from people is why media psychology? Why does a computer geek elect to pursue a graduate degree in psychology? The answer is very complex. My simulation of the United States and American culture is a little crazy at times. I found myself, found myself struggling to keep some of the American ideals straight as I find them, found them contradictory. The politics in the country was bizarre where everything was boiled down to a dichotomous choice. In the same vein, all political communications were framed to push people into binary decisions on issues as well. I found that there was as much misinformation and disinformation as there were clear stories in the media. It made me very confused about how the country managed to get anything done when the system was designed to create chaos and gridlock. As I observed the political system and the support in the media, it led me to a realization that people were voting against their best interests because of the information or lack thereof within the mass media. So it forced me to seek out answers. It forced me to get educated on the media politics and understand the intersection of the two worlds. As a result, these are the areas where my interest naturally gravitated and I spent the better part of five years researching. As I drilled down into the subject matter, I ran into a number of interesting topics that required me to gain greater understanding. You can see why this took me half a decade of research and generated 100 pages of references in my dissertation. So I invite you to follow me in this journey. I warn you, you take the blue pill, the story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I'll show you how deep this rabbit hole goes. So has everybody had their red pill? Excellent, let's move on. The first issue I decided to look at was media ownership and the history of media ownership in the United States. From William Randolph Hearst to Rupert Murdoch, media ownership has always had a huge influence on information dissemination. To understand the impact of ownership, I need to understand the function of mass media in our culture and our society. Mass media has a great deal of influence on our society. Their primary charge has been to monitor the world around us and provide information to society at large. Through this provision of information, mass media helps provide social order. At the same time, they can shape people's attitudes towards events and even shape public policy. Mass media is key in passing along norms and values to large populations across a large and very diverse country. Finally, mass media is there to provide entertainment and help us relax, forgetting many of the problems that plague us during our regular mon mundane daily grind. Over decades, mass media has been diligent in performing its duty as an educator. Who hasn't seen Sesame Street or watched an incredibly interesting documentary that's changed your perspective on a particular subject matter? The mass media once told us about meaningful issues of importance that could impact our lives or those of our fellow human beings sharing this tiny rock with us. The news media was once our voice to the powerful, asking the hard questions that we ordinary citizens could not, and maintaining a level of oversight to those with money and power. Most importantly, mass media once taught us what was just and right. They showed us examples that we could follow by singling out the best and the brightest. Mass media gave a voice to those who didn't have one and helped establish the norms society was expected to maintain. 
At one time, there were hundreds of independent publishing houses. Publishing was big business, and each publishing company had a unique style and voice they shared with their customers, the readers. But thousands of newspapers that were around the country were independent and provided a voice for their local community. This guaranteed a diversity of voice and issues and explained how a given problem or public policy would affect the specific region. The local newspaper was the voice of the local community. Following that same metaphor, the local radio station was the ear of the community. There was as much listening as there was talking. The back and forth between the local radio station and the listener is what developed unique mus musical tastes to the region and the incredible diversity of music across the country. The local television station and the local news team provided a representative voice of the community at large. When national interests focused on the smaller community, it was the local reporters that would do the reporting and provide the details greatly needed about the local community. Things have definitely changed. Turning on the TV, we can see an almost endless stream of channels, and they're, supposed, and they're supposedly keeping us informed and entertained. I'm still curious, with 200 channels out there, how come when you turn the TV on, there's nothing cold worth watching. All of this media that I've just outlined is supposed to bring us a broad, diverse source of information. We were to have voices from all walks of life and all corners of the country. At least that's what you would think. <coughs> Those voices have been silenced. Mass media has been consolidated into the hands of five corporations in, here in the United States. There is a sixth but most of its assets are offshore, and we only see a very minor influence. The consolidation of ownership continues to spread as we speak. Time Warner is currently in talks with AT&T about an $85 billion merger that will again consolidate control over another spectrum of mass media. The diversity of voices was silenced as programming was consolidated and directed out of the corporate offices and local translator stations mothballed and austerity programs. So now we have a mediascape where 98% of what we see on television, hear on radio, read in print or online is now controlled by six global corporations. How did we get to this point where our media has been concentrated into five or six huge corporations? What could possibly prevent prevented this? Regulation has become a bit of a dirty word in the United States. For some reason, it has been associated with an anti-business movement. The reality is that when regulations are drafted and managed properly, they protect the industry and the public from abuses such as monopolies and the many negative aspects that come with this practice. Creating rules that everyone abides by provides, provides an even, even playing field and greater competition. As well, because the broadcast spectrum is finite, it means that the frequency band must be managed appropriately. Not only must we protect that finite resource, we should safeguard it from abuses that may harm the public at large. The FCC is that body responsible for the safeguarding of the broadcast spectrum. They are the ones who grant and rewrote licenses and make decisions based on societal expectations. The FCC has a responsibility to regulate ownership and prevent monopolies. They also grant licenses based on programming and filling a need for the public. The FCC also ensures that there will be public access and local content. They are also supposed to provide protections against the improper use of media or inappropriate coverage of issues by the media. In this particular election cycle, we've seen more than a few of them. But we find ourselves in a very different time where it can be argued the FCC has let us down. Mega corporations have gobbled up all of the media outlets of all types and have eliminated diversity in their messages. But it wasn't always that way. Again, how did we get here? The answer is deregulation. Deregulation is the opposite of regulation. Deregulation is all about removing controls and limits. Just to remind everybody, regulations are designed to protect the industry or the public from harm. Deregulation allows for the removal of many of those protective mechanisms, no matter how much sense they make, 
or how well they have protected us over the years. Historically, there have been several key pieces of law that establish a balanced playing field and maintain ownership limits preventing the law monopolies in local, regional, and national markets. The most important regulation was the Communications Act of 1934. This law was signed into being by FDR and was intended to place controls on the burgeoning commercial radio market. The most important controversial aspect of, of this particular law was regulation of chain ownership. A court challenged to remove this and allow the possible of monopolies, but the court left this section of law intact, preventing large chains from monopolizing markets. The Communications Act of 1934 provided stability in the mass media market for 62 years. Working in concert with the Communications Act of 1934 was the Fairness Doctrine a framework which provided for fairness and civility uh, in the broadcast public discourse. The Fairness Doctrine was established to promote balance in the mass media and prevent proselytizing from any given ideology. The Fairness Doctrine guaranteed equal time to all sides on an issue and prevented a reporter from injecting bias into the reporting on that given subject. These two important pieces of legislation began to see erosions in their administrative power in 1984, when the Cable Communications Act was amended to the 1934 law, bringing the satellite and cable markets into the discussion and setting up rules governing those two spectrums. The Telecommunications Act of 1996 replaced the 1934 law and entrenched a series of significant changes to the law. Many of those alterations began as minor changes from the mid-80s under Ronald Reagan's administration but a power play in Congress dramatically reshaped the law, most of all, deregulating the media industries. A quick review of deregulation. Deregulation began in Eris in 1987 when Ronald Reagan appointed Mark Fowler killed the Fairness Doctrine. He did so under the excuse of there being a blatant liberal bias within the media. Now I have to ask, if there was truly a liberal bias in the mass media, would a conservative kill the one piece of legislation that guaranteed him fair access to the airwaves? Interesting question. A bit of history here, Joseph Coors had designs on starting his own conservative news network in the 1970s. He had approached a young media expert to head the effort, but the Fairness Doctrine and Communications Act of 1934 stood in his way. Ronald Reagan was supported by conservative icon Joseph Coors, and he paid a lot of money to get Reagan elected president. So was it a coincidence that Reagan got the deregulation ball rolling and happened to get the Fairness Doctrine quashed and then change the ownership rules that would allow for a conservative news network? Changes in regulation would also affect media ownership, allowing for an expansion into multiple media markets across the country. So the major change that reshaped the media landscape and set us to the path where we are today was in 1996 when the Republican House and Senate pushed through the Telecommunications Act of 1996, where restrictions on media ownership were almost eliminated. This change allowed for corporations to move in and begin to buy up local translators and consolidate the media in almost every market. This meant that multiple stations could be owned in a single marketplace but cross-media ownership also became a reality. Of interest, one particular company could then own the local newspaper, the local radio station, and the local TV station at the same time. What kind of effect do you think that had on diversity of opinion and information and programming in that particular marketplace? As a result of the consolidation of mass media, there were a number of immediate negative consequences. We saw a loss of public service broadcasting, especially alternative broadcasting from the local, uh, local translator compared to that of the, of the corporate office. Corporate ownership was also responsible for censoring or completely removing the news department from local stations. Austerity programs eliminated large swaths of the newsroom and encouraged the use of information from the corporate office or prepackaged products from special interests. 
Worst of all, the corporate directors started relying on more servicing specific demographics rather than being concerned for quality informational programming. But the most important and damaging aspect of the changes in the Telecommunications Act of 1996 was the change in ownership restrictions. Deregulation allowed corporate interests to step in and control whole marketplaces and eliminate the diversity of information and opinion, which is one of the great things that makes the United States so different from other countries. Overall, the results of deregulation had some significant impacts on the mass media, especially in the realm of journalism. The newsrooms were eliminated and the programming was pushed down from the central authority of the corporate office. Every market repeated the same information in pretty much the same way. The echo chamber effect was then institutionalized. Most damning in all of this is the loss of, of confidence in the mass media. The days of being a trusted voice in mass media, like Edward R. Murrow or Walter Cronkite, are long gone. Now we have to rely on the likes of Katie Couric or Wolf Blitzer. This has caused a polarization in the audience and a schism in the mass media. People have their own media and have a great level of distrust for others. Limited ownership has had a chilling effect on democracy. The ability to control the flow of information is where democracy can be restricted. An ill-informed electorate is certain to make poor decisions about representation and as a result see poor public policy created. Deregulation was to remove restrictions on the flow of information, but the consolidation of mass media through corporate ownership has actually had the exact effect the policymakers claim they were trying to prevent. The limited ownership has allowed for the managing of the message when the mass media injects bias into their communications, they exacerbate the bias issue in their viewership. A sad outcome of deregulation and consolidation of mass media is the loss of the journalistic organs that we relied upon to get information into the hands of the electorate. Once the corporations eliminated, eliminated the newsrooms across the country and started servicing information from the central authority, we saw a complete loss of the information availability on the important local and regional issues. Today, the loss of that local perspective has left most Americans unable to identify their congressman or senator, let alone their local state or local representative. As well, corporate owners have turned loss leader money losing newsroom and departments into profit centers, which resulted in the elimination of bodies to break even, and a loss in the ability to do investigative journalism in the local community. <coughs> Soft news is all that gets produced. The loss of hard news negatively impacts our community or informs them on issues so important to the development of that solid community. The austerity and reductions in the newsroom caused news programming to be outsourced. Interested third parties would sell pre-packaged stories to the mass media, or special interests would provide pre-produced content to the stations at no cost. This is a very important issue to understand. Some of the stories you see in the mass media are placed there by special interests, hoping to influence the general public or the electorate. As a result, one of the major functions provided by the mass media was marginalized or completely lost in some regards. The mass media was the oversight function to the political mechanism in the country. But because of the pressure to produce friendly content, the reporters that were left in the newsroom spent more time building friendly relationships with the politicians rather than worrying about challenging them on their policy positions. This shady journalism has led to a catch-22. If you don't know how bad your representation is, you're not very likely to be inclined to vote that person out of office. Media consolidation has led to a slippery slope for the electorate. Poor political governance leads to more deregulation, greater media consolidation, greater profits for corporations, and negative political outcomes with a more poorly informed electorate. It also leads to longer terms for career politicians who rely on a dumbed down voter to get reelected. If we hope to save our mass media and return it to the level of respectability it once had, regulation becomes a necessary evil. 
The, the monopolies that currently exist have no doubt had some pretty negative outcomes on our mass media. But there is still hope we can reclaim our mass media so they can provide the services we once expected of them. Until we find this balance in the marketplace again, we are likely to continue to see identity politics be the main stories in the media and a continued divide between voters on issues that really don't impact them. Deregulation caused a vacuum, in fact, in the mass media. Yes, in a way, it caused it to suck. Many of the responsibilities that the mass media was expected to maintain, including a public trust in providing us meaningful journalism and informing the electorate, was lost with the spirit of programs focused on the new profit centers in these corporate-owned bodies. The lack of qualified journalists and the loss of news-gathering organs in newsrooms across the country left a void in the current content production area, and as a result, a dumbed-down electric. I will let the esteemed nephew of Sigmund Freud and the pioneer in the field of propaganda, I will let him drive the point home. The conscious and intelligent manipulation of organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. Those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government which is the true ruling power of our country. We're dominated by the relatively small number of persons. It is they who pull the wires which control the public mind, who harness all social forces and contrive new ways to bind and guide the world. This leads us to a point I like to refer to as convergence. Whether you wish to believe that all of these events are connected, we have arrived at a point in history where they've all come crashing together to create a perfect storm, one with immense power and destructive force. It is really up to you to decide if the dissent that we see in the public sphere was spontaneous and as a result of an incredible number of coincidences, or if this is a manufactured state we find ourselves. To quickly review how we arrived here, changes in the FCC regulation up to the playing field. The elimination of fairness doctrine allowed the growth of ideologically focused programming. Ownership rules changed love for consolidation of media. Mass media journalists, journalistic enterprises became profit centers. Mass media um, used austerity programs and trimmed or elim eliminated news gathering and information processing bodies for regional broadcasters. News production is centralized. Because of the costs and availability, the use of outside subject matters increased. I really want to emphasize this point. Having the ability to manage the network where information is accessed is the ultimate gateway to power. Consolidation of media ownership has achieved the maximum control over those information networks. When you can manage the information that comes from your media stream, you're restricting the information from those who can access it. So if you have a desire to affect social change, like changing norms, the next logical management target is the message itself. This is where corporations have really caused a problem. Outside interests have managed to develop a production mechanism to forward their informational needs, not ours. As a result of having access to the mass media network, special interests are also able to not only manage the narrative, but also the repetition cycle by which the information is broadcast. Finally, because they both, they own both ends of the information management process, they can inject ideology directly into the media stream. But I'm sure you're wondering, how does this work? Certainly people would recognize such brazen attempts at manipulation. This is where the psychology stuff comes in. This is where I try to give you some insight into the person to the left and the right of you, how they think. I didn't say insight into you, because, of course, you guys are part of the problem, right? Our first stop in the psych department is the field of neuropsychology. This is literally how your brain works. So we're going to pop the hood, and we're going to check the wire. Much of the groundwork, and the, um, the breaking groundwork, was completed by some very talented people with access to some very powerful equipment. These folks are just a small list of the people who contributed greatly to this field and speak directly to the issue of understanding how our brains work and the contrast between populations of people. 
So, neurology is the study of our brains and the relationships between behavior, emotion, and cognition. It looks at your brains from a process and behavior perspective. It provides insight into our brains and which specific regions are being used during cognitive processing. It uses various technologies to view which neurons are firing in our brains, lighting up specific regions of our brains which we know control certain aspects of our behaviors. When these regions activate, they show up with the heat map. This slide shows the results of various functional MRI scans and displays the regions of the brain that are involved in various interactions. The subject is in an fMRI machine and is given specific cognitive tasks to do while being observed and controlled. As the individual works through the process, the area of the brain in use lights up like a Christmas tree. This gives us insight into how we think about things and where the processing takes place. What it has done is lead to some very interesting conclusions about how we are wired and why we are susceptible to specific types of communication. When you hear people say you are born a conservative or a liberal, it appears, it appears there's a lot of truth to that statement. The work of neurologists and neuropsychologists have helped identify the specific parts of the brain that individuals use while processing political messages. It turns out that conservatives rely mostly on the amygdala and liberals rely on the cingulate cortex. The conservative brain relies on the amygdala. This small structure is part of our limbic system, which is our emotion center and home to our fight flight response. It is associated with the declarative and episodic memory areas. It is more commonly referred to as our fear center. Individuals with conservative leanings or bias were shown to have the greatest activity in this area during the fMRI sessions. Cognitive processing has repeatedly been shown to be centralized in the two amygdala regions. Individuals that are pre-wired to use this region of the brain are more likely to re react to stimuli aggressively, make <coughs> rapid decisions, and base things on a binary decision tree to either fight or flee. Conversely, the liberal brain relies heavily on the anterior cing cingulate cortex. It's a portion in the front of our heads. This structure is part of the cingulate cortex. It is associated with information processing, decision making, and impulse control. It is also responsible for managing some of our autonomic functions like blood pressure, heart rate, and managing reward and dissipation. Individuals with liberal leanings or bias were shown to have the greatest activity in this area during the fMRI scans. People that rely on this area of the brain tend to rely more on processing more than reacting. They are more likely to appear to be standing there, weighing their options, than to do the smart thing and run when danger rears its ugly head. fMRI scans explain a lot about how our brains work but it doesn't determine which group of individuals are superior or inferior to the other. What it does tell us is what type of communication you're most likely going to accept and react to. Conservatives are going to mostly likely respond to stimuli centered on emotions, especially fear-based campaigns. Liberals are most likely to respond to stimuli that challenges them to weigh out consequences and rely on the concepts of social, social justice. Conservatives are more likely to engage in a fight or run from it. For liberals, it's likely the communications that give them options and outcomes are going to reach them most effectively. So now that we have some insight into what part of the brain liberals and conservatives use to process political messages, the next question is how you craft a message to drive a person to a predetermined policy position. The primary tools of the trade for anyone hoping to manipulate the media is framing, semantics, fear, and repetition. They are obvious when you know what to look for, but it is not the most powerful tool the media is disposal. That honor goes to agenda setting. You're about to learn how these five psychological theories are used to create a never-ending divide in the electorate. They are what I call weapons of mass deception. Framing is the process of managing a message so as to influence an individual's perception of the meaning of communication. The idea behind framing is to construct a social reality 
which the receiver of communication can immediately understand and develop an emotional reaction towards. Frames are used to develop a simple context that receivers will immediately understand. Many times complex issues are distilled to the most base and emotional terms. For example, the issue of abortion is distilled to a binary perspective being pro-life or pro-choice. The complexity of the issue and the internet's interconnects which exist between this and other related issues is boiled down to an emotionally charged dichotomous choice. Metaphors are used to provide context and tap into the sections of our brains that make our decisions. To reach the pro-life set, you may focus on the innocence of the unborn child, relying in, on images of cute babies. To reach the pro-choice set, you instead focus on the subjugation of the mother and her not having control over her own body, relying on images of sailing in chains. Frames are constructed to communicate the specific meaning for a given condition, identifying ideological outcomes for problematic conditions or situations where a defined outcome can foment change. Framing gives communicators the opportunity to make attributions regarding who or what is to blame, articulate alternatives, and urge others to act in a cooperative effort to effect change. Frames are established for us at a very young age, and these frames create neural connections or pathways within our brains that can be activated using appropriate elements in a communication stream. We are all familiar with the archetypes of the hero, the anti-hero and the villain, the damsel in distress. We learn from a very young age, whether it be through nurturing from our parents, oral narratives from our friends, or just good old-fashioned media exposure, like your favorite Saturday morning cartoon. We begin to understand the good guy from the bad guy, the victim from the victimizer, and that right always defeats wrong. Looking at this image and delving deeper, we can also see that the good guy is Caucasian. The bad guy is a different color, and the damsel was rescued by a guy on a white horse. All of these are very strong metaphors that children learn, and then we rely upon them in making social judgments for the rest of their lives. Now, before we move on, I just want to point out the good guy is Canadian. <laughs> Neuroscientists and linguists alike will point out that the most effective frames are those that rely on cultural narratives and metaphors. A common cultural narrative for Americans would be the belief of America's greatest greatness and superior, superiority over all others, that all nations aspire to be like the United States and everyone wants to come to America. The accuracy of this narrative is irrelevant as it is drilled into America starting at a very young age and becomes the foundation for the unconditional love for their country, or what you might call patriotism. These are a quick collection of images I discovered by doing a Google search for American patriotism. The symbolism is astounding. The flag-waving crowd, the bald eagle complete with the spectacular paint job. PETA supporters, please look away. Um, Uncle Sam demanding your love for your country, the Constitution, more flags, and more eagles. Then there's the baby in the flag, the young, innocent rat in the only swaddling clothes that can properly protect it, and with the military supporting it for added strength. Wonderful imagery that will make many parts of your brain activate, and likely that your parts well and want and you know, challenge you to recite the Pledge of Allegiance. This image is a great example of framing and metaphors being built into an image. The frame we see here is about America and American patriotism. Here we see a well-known hero and champion of the cause, having a firm grip on the flag which represents the nation. This is a big, strong white man who is in your face with America. He is taking an aggressive stance and he looks ready for business. You are not taking that flag or America away from him. His massive physique is intimidating and flexing those muscles is a show of force. He is also wearing a cross, displaying his, his Judeo-Christian morals. Truly a great image, chock full of amazing metaphors. The concept behind using these things and metaphors is to activate specific regions of your brain. 
Metaphors are associated with stored memories. And with those memories are associated emotions. Each of those memory locations can be accessed through a neural network or pathway. As specific neural networks are activated, the associated networks are also activated. This is why when you hear a particular song on the radio, you can be taken back to the time when that song had a specific meaning to you. You can stir up old feelings and your senses become so active to where you swear you can recall exact smells or tastes from that time. Accessing one pathway grants access to the other. This is important to understand because this framing can be used to push us into specific camps on controversial issues. An example of this is injustice framing. Injustice frames are extremely important in political communication and the go-to strategy for political messages. Injustice frames call attention to the ways victims are identified and treated in the social context. This frame of victimhood leads to either conscious consensus mobilization, finding agreement amongst parties of the injustice done, or action mobilization, generating protest and mustering support on a given issue. We see an example of this framing in mass media in relation to alleged oppression of minorities by law enforcement officers. During events in the past few years, we've seen instances of excessive force being used by police. In one frame, the police officers are viewed as being upholders of law and order and having a very difficult job to do. This is an agreement that is reached by all parties. The other frame we see is the officers overreacting, targeting minorities, and then subjecting them to violence. This would be an example of the second point. How are frames used so efficiently against us? Through careful crafting of messages to use appropriate words to activate networks. This is where semantics comes into play. Semantics is the study of meaning and communication. Semantics provides the tools to properly analyze and interpret the actual meaning of what is said or written at any given time. Semantics extends to the use of sounds, expression, and body language. There is a claim that only 7% of communication is verbal, and the rest being body language and intonation. Really? Let's try a simple exercise. If I look at you and I go, Dude! Or I look at you and I go, Dude! Or I look at you and I go, Dude! They all transfer a different message to each person. Now let's try and extend that exercise to the printed word. How many contextual factors are missing as a result of the lost communication components? It is said context is everything, but so is denotation and connotation. Denotation is the literal or primary meaning of a word in contrast to the feelings that word suggests. Connotation is that associated meaning. So when Donald Trump speaks of a wall, he speaks of a physical wall rather than a symbolic wall. This is a good example of that particular contrast. Semantics become a very powerful tool in managing messages and activating specific networks using metaphors. Remember when the estate tax was rebranded as the debt tax? The network access this minor semantic change offered was huge. Just by changing the frame from the, from the state, a word associated with transference of wealth, to death, a word that, act, that activates negative imagery of us facing our own mortality, we completely change our base response to the issue based on the metaphors and neural networks of access. The very small minority got a windfall from the vast majority, people that will never be able to take advantage of this break, all because of the change of one word. Same can be said about other words used in the media. Looking at the Affordable, affordable Care Act, the use of death pens. All these words are ridiculous terms, but very effective in reaching their target and making people's minds up before they have a chance to engage their cognitive processes. 
but the intent is to make you react, make no mistake. The goal is to get those portions to your brain to activate that makes you cease cognitive processing and make emotional decisions. And it works. This is all intentional, and it's about moving the audience. Republican pollster and linguist Dr. Frank Luntz has been responsible for much of the framing done by Republican politicians over the past 20 years, including the creation of terms like death tax and death pens. It was Luntz who directed Republicans to begin using loaded language and attack the opposition with words like corrupt, devour, greed, hypocrisy, liberal, which is now a dirty word, sick, and traitors. This is done intentionally to drive you in one particular direction, either for or against an issue. And then you get entrenched in that particular support. Once you commit to that side of the argument, you establish an in-group relationship. They know this, and this in-group behavior is going to take over you, and you will do almost anything, include challenge what you, what you know, and even your moral fabric, so that you maintain um, position within that particular social group. The outcome of changing your view is ostracism. We are seeing it in this election cycle. People that turn their back on Donald Trump are outright attacked and then ostracized. For this reason, you're seeing high-powered Republicans eschew their personal morals and falling in line with the direction their party is being dragged. Even the most devoted are being questioned and forced to make a decision about their support for the candidate and their party. For some groups, this must be extremely painful. For the Christians and evangelicals who are forced to abandon their moral high ground and support a candidate that flies in the face of their long-held beliefs, the cognitive distance they face must be difficult to manage day to day. This is all intentional, and it's part of the overall communication and control strategy. And yes, it happens on both sides of the political divide. It's just extremely overt on one side of the aisle in this particular election cycle. It just shows that fear of being marginalized or excluded is a great motivator. Now, it needs to be acknowledged that fear and emotional appeals are the greatest political motivator of all. Countries have been moved to extremes through the use of fear campaigns. The rise of nationalism is usually directly related to an irrational fear of some interest identified as the root of all evil. This election cycle is no different. Fear has stoked both sides of the election. The conservative side driven by a fear of Mexicans, fear of Muslims, fear of crime, fear of the economy, and so on. The liberal side has been fed a steady diet of fear of Donald Trump and what a Trump presidency would look like. Both are, of course, ridiculous. There are checks and balances built into our political system, but they make for effective messaging campaigns. They also allow easy access to the mass media who are more than willing to promote a story that can scare the pants off people. The reason why fear campaigns are used so often is because they work. Research indicates that people will search out answers to threatening information they hear or read and use that source of what they think is a viable solution as their safe space. So when a politician says that the Mexicans are coming to rape and murder you and your sleep, then follows up with a promise to build a wall, a high wall, a beautiful wall, it's going to be a wall that works and Mexico's going to pay for it. You are likely to see that as a viable solution in response to the threat information. This, beca this becomes, in your mind, a reasoned response and approach to a threatening situation. The more you have this threat repeated, and the more you hear the plan to reduce the threat itself, the more your fear is reinforced, and the more you are likely to turn to this response plan, no matter how irrational and ridiculous it may seem, we saw this with the very same type of campaign used effectively in the 1950s with the duck and cover campaign promoted by the Federal Civil Defense Administration and the National Education Administration to deal with the possible nuclear attack from the Soviet Union. There's a lot of young people in here, so you may not know what duck and cover is. You do? I am from Soviet Union. Oh, okay. 
Excellent. Okay. Um, this duck and cover campaign was extremely powerful in tradition a generation of school children how to react in the event of a nuclear attack. But this isn't the only example of this conditioning at work. You are likely unaware of other things you have been conditioned to do. If you see a red light, what do you do? If you hear someone call for help, what number do you dial? If a cop pulls up behind you on US 60, what do you do? You are conditioned to behave in specific ways. There is also a great cause of memory failure. Encoding errors in our memories are most often a result of fear. Would it surprise you to know that 40% of Americans have false memories of the events that took place on September 11, 2001? The fear that was broadcast into homes and offices across the nation greatly affected us all, but for 40% of the population, they cannot properly recall the events of that day. Some will say they were in one place when they were actually in another. Some will swear they witnessed the first plane hit the tower when it was the second plane. Some even seem to recall seeing Arab Americans dancing in the streets of New Jersey as the towers came down, which has been proven to be patently false. Fear can do some crazy things to our bodies, but also to our minds. The reason for this is how our brains work. That fear response center is very much like a traffic cop when the lights go out. That cop routes the incoming traffic to the location they feel will relieve the pressure. Since the amygdala is the traffic cop, and the amygdala is our fight flight response center, we will more often than not flee from a source of fear or danger. The amygdala will actually prevent us from accessing our higher brain functions, prevent us from reasoning, and give us a good hard kick in the pants to get away from negative stimuli. Also, Far more neural fibers project from our brain's emotional center into the logic rational centers than the reverse. So emotions often are a greater determinant of our behavior than our brain's logical rational processes. Extreme fear makes us rely on our primeval brain and follow our innate instincts. We cease to be rational and become immediately emotional relying on our base instincts to help us survive. The outcomes of long-term exposure to fear can be substantial. Brain chemistry can be altered and individuals can be conditioned to live in fear. Just short bursts of stress can force an individual into an unstable condition and is much more susceptible to manipulation. Worse, people who have been conditioned through prolonged fear exposure have been shown to have challenges encoding and decoding memories. Since these memories are activated through framing efforts, these false memories can alter an individual's response to fear stimuli. For this reason, we must be extremely guarded about long-term exposure to fear, as it is a gateway to reasoning failures, paranoia, and delusion. We should be aware that repetition of fear appraisals have significant consequences. Repetition is a classic tool used for conditioning, memory formation, and reinforcement. Did I mention that repetition is a classic tool used for conditioning, memory formation, and reinforcement? We are naturally skeptical of information that comes from a single source. Unless that source is considered to be extremely trustworthy, we are not likely to accept information dissemination to us only from a single source. We usually go and look for a second source of that information to confirm the validity of the information in question. Unfortunately, we are not overly critical of the sources of information we use to provide message validity. Many times, we'll accept a second voice from the same source of information as confirmation of that data. This makes us very susceptible to a phenomenon referred to as the echo chamber effect. The echo chamber is the result of the same information being repeated by any number of outlets, but not providing provenance as to where the message originated. We see this a lot in mass media, where one outlet will break the story, and the other outlets will immediately pick up on it without fully investigating or vetting the information on their own. 
We also see this in politics through the use of talking point memos, which are short, concise statements on hot issues that are distributed from party headquarters to best manage what is said in the mass media. For years, Fox News received talking points from the Republican National Committee and used those in the framing of stories they broadcast. Remaining on your talking points and only using the information in those talking points is referred to as message discipline. It is this repetition of information that makes us quick to adopt messages. The more we hear the same information, the more likely we are to accept it as fact, regardless of validity. We are even willing to accept the information from the same people so long as it is broadcast from a second medium. We may hear Sean Hannity speak on a story we're watching television, but if we hear that exact same commentator, commentator talk to us on the radio as we're driving home from work, we accept that as a secondary source of information. As long as we are continually exposed to the same information and in repeated enough times, we will accept the information as factual in nature. There is still a substantial number of Americans that believe Saddam Hussein had a role in 9-11 and that the sitting president is a Muslim, regardless of the information provide that proves otherwise. One of the reasons that repetition is so effective is that humans seek out things that comfort us. This applies to information as well. As we are exposed to the same information, we forget where we heard it for the first time. We will then take comfort in hearing it again, even if it comes from the same source. We still like to find that second source of information, but repetition will, have, will keep us happy if it comes down to it. It is probably not worth repeating, but repetition works. It is how conditioning works and why we are creatures of habit. So when you hear a bell ring, do you salivate? Or do you feel like watching Fox News? This brings us to the final subject in our journey down the mass media rabbit hole. Our final subject is agenda setting. This is how and why the public thinks about specific topics. Agenda setting is all about trying to establish issue salience within a population. Agenda setting theory posits that issue salience can be established by the position by which information is presented. Informa information presented first is obviously the most important while well, information presented last must not be as important. It is also important to recognize which information is presented versus which is not. If information is not presented, it certainly must not be worthy of our attention, and we should not be concerned about its existence. Agenda setting theory also states that accuracy or quality of information is unimportant. Only when the information is discussed and the le length by which it is discussed provides issue settings. Agenda, agenda setting theory basically says that people assume the importance and quality of information based on the position of the story from their choosing, cho chosen media source. So if someone reads the paper, the important information should be on the front page and should be the headline. If you watch TV or listen to radio, the information should be the lead and consume the most amount of time during the broadcast. Agenda setting theory is extremely important because the mass media is the place we get the vast majority of our information. It is what we use to inform our political perspectives. We adopt a definition of issues based on the information that the mass media provides for us. There are two levels of agenda setting that everybody should be aware of. The first is concerned with the salience of objects. The second level is focused on the attributes used to describe these objects. Substantive attributes are the logical descriptors which place constraints around an object. The value of attributes are the terms used to describe the object. Hillary Clinton would be a substantive attribute of the object. Crooked would be the value of attribute. The first level the first level agenda setting is focused on the facts gathered on the given subject. These substantive attributes require conscious cognitive processing to evaluate. The second level agenda setting is focused on the evaluative attributes and the presentation of the information. This is where our emotions can get involved in evaluating data. 
Our opinions are driven more by the evaluative attributes than the data itself. If our emotions are engaged during the presentation of information, we will more often or not develop an opinion driven less by rational thought and more by gut instinct and how we feel at the time. This is where everything comes crashing together. Agenda setting states that presentation of objects tells us what to think. But the attributes used in describing objects tells us how to think about the subject matter. How a viewer is told to think about an object establishes a new level of salience. We allow the mass media to frame our understanding of objects through the use of semantics, force it into memory using fear, and then entrench this information as fact through repetition of information. To break out of this trap, we need to recognize the evaluative attributes used to describe objects and not accept those particular definitions. We need to understand that the evaluative attributes are where bias is injected into a particular story. This is what we need to be on the watch for as we consume media. Yes, we finally come to the end of our journey. I'm not going to say that our mass media is untrustworthy. That would be a massive cop-out. There are many good journalists out there that do a fine job pulling together the facts and writing the stories. Where we see the major breakdown in our mass media is the controls placed on the news organs by the corporate controllers. News media is one of the trusted components of our society because they stood up against the elite and challenged their power. The diversity in the media made it difficult to manage. The laws in place made sure we would always have that diversity. But deregulation changed the landscape and allowed for consolidation and ownership which destroyed that diversity. It also eliminated the requirements for fairness and balance, and those mechanisms are now only a cheesy byline on cable TV. One more word in closing. This presentation may show you some of the failings within our system, how we are manipulated, and how and why we do things against our own best interest. Having said that, we live in a democracy, and the only way to change the system is to use your vote. I strongly encourage you to all head to the polls and exercise your civic responsibility. When you do, you become part of the solution. Also remember that you vote every single day when you spend a dollar. Your spending habits determine which corporations remain in business and which advertisers have impacts on programming in the media. So when you spend one of these, make sure you do so responsibly. May your votes count and change the system so it works for all of us. I'd like to thank you for your attention and open up the board question and answer.